I want to show you these massive ponderosa pine trees. This thing is magnificent. Oh wait, it's dead. This one next to it is dead too. If we go down here, there are these three big ones, but they are dead too. At least that one's still alive. But at the alarming rate these big old pines have started dying the last few years, I think its days are numbered, and that number is getting smaller. These ones are still alive for now. It's hard to tell whether this one's alive or dead because all these Douglas fir and white firs have grown up so thick around it, can't even see the top of it. That's what the problem is. All these thick fir trees that have grown up so thick around these pines are one of the reasons why these massive pines are dying. The one next to it is dead, so is the one behind it. Periodic wildfire used to burn through here every few years and keep all these fir trees under control. Around 100 years ago, people started putting out those wildfires. Since there haven't been any wildfires here in the last decades to keep these firs under control, they've grown up so thick, they are now choking out the big ponderosas that have been here for hundreds of years. Now we have too many trees competing for limited resources and creating a huge fuel load that will one day fuel a catastrophic wildfire. These massive ponderosas that are still alive probably aren't going to last much longer. If you look at the older trees that have been here hundreds of years, like these incense cedars, you'll see char on the lower base of the trees. The lower base? Of course the base is going to be lower. Just about every one of these cedars has char at the base. This one has bear claw marks. Some up there too. All of these cedars are charred. This one has char and bear claw marks too. Looks like a young bear here was into climbing trees. Every one of these hundreds of years old cedars have char on them. But they are still alive, they survived every one of those fires. The big ponderosas went through the same fires, but you don't see the char on them like you do the cedars because the ponderosas have this flaky bark. The char that was on them all flaked off long ago. Unless you can find one with a fire scar. Any of these pines that have a scar, you can see char on them. They've obviously gone through fire and survived. That's one of the ways these ponderosas can be resistant to low and medium intensity fire. When a fire starts burning up the tree, this flaky bark flakes off and the fire falls off with the flakes. Between that and having thick, well-insulated bark that protects the tree, these ponderosas can be very fire resistant. The cedars don't have that flaky bark, which is why we still see the char on them. They just have thick, well-insulated bark that protects the tree. The big trees that are here in this fire-shaped landscape are the more fire resistant varieties like the incense cedar and the ponderosa pine which still show the evidence of hundreds of years of repeated fires. Which brings us back to the problem. One of the reasons these big ponderosa pines are dying is they haven't had fire here in 80, 90 years. As we crawl out of this thick overgrown mass of fir trees, we get into a small spot that's a little bit more historically natural for this area. We have these more open grown pines and cedars. They don't have to compete as much with the massive number of fir trees that are in those areas where the pines are dying. Ponderosa pine lays down this thick layer of highly flammable pine needles. Ever since whatever the time was that these type of forests were invented, lightning would regularly start fires. The Native Americans knew the importance of fires in these kind of forests. They would start fires in these kind of forests. When a place like this would burn, these highly flammable pine needles on the ground would carry a fire along, it would clean up all the junk, it would kill most of these seedlings, especially the firs. Occasionally a seedling will survive a fire, especially one like this one that doesn't have a lot of fuel around it, especially the pines. The pine seedlings aren't as big of a problem under the big pine trees because they are not shade tolerant. 
They don't like growing under the shade of where trees already exist. Whereas the more shade tolerant firs do just fine under the shade of the pines. These pine seedlings are quite old. They've just been sitting here stagnant under the shade of the bigger trees. The few trees that are able to survive repeated fires over hundreds of years are the ones that end up being these massive trees. The key word being the few trees that survive. Actually, the few trees that survive. That's five keywords, not one keyword. Now that we've taken natural fire out of these areas, most of these seedlings survive and grow up into these mass overgrown thick forests, which are completely unnatural. Instead of just having a few fir trees here and there, these overcrowding fir trees are pulling much of the water out of the ground. Now there's not enough water in the ground to support the big pine trees. During drought years without enough water, they get stressed, then the bark beetles kill them. These few small open areas that are left, it's only gonna be a matter of time before the firs take these over too. They've already started. This is forest service land. It's right next to my family's forest land that's been in the family around 100 years. My grandfather, told stories about how they used to ride their horses through here. It was nothing but big trees, mostly these big pines, and bunch grass on the ground. They used to graze their horses back here. Now, it would be hard to ride a horse through here. It would be hard to graze horses back here because there's hardly anything on the ground for them or wildlife to eat. Fires maintain big trees and more grasses. Without fire, a lot of the grasses and forbs are choked out. There are only a few small open areas like this left, but it won't be long before these will all grow up with firs like everywhere else in here. And these huge ponderosas probably won't survive. That's only part of the problem. What may be an even greater threat to these forests is the threat of catastrophic wildfire. These forests have grown up so thick, there's such a massive fuel load here when we do get a fire, not if, but when we do get a fire in here, it's likely going to burn so hot, it's going to kill everything, including the big cedars and the big ponderosas. They can survive the historic ground fires, but we have all these ladder fuels. These ladder fuels carry the fire from the ground all the way up into the canopies of the trees. Instead of having a low ground fire, all those ladder fuels are going to carry the fire up into the crowns of the trees and kill them. Instead of being the low intensity type of fire that put the char on all these trees, that these trees have been able to survive for hundreds of years, the next time a fire comes through here, what used to be a forest of beautiful, giant ponderosa pine and cedar is going to look like this. When my grandfather was a teenager, his dad, my great-grandfather, came up here when there was a fire so he could save the cabin, which he was obviously able to do. Back then, wildfires weren't such a big deal. He said the fire just burned over the mountain in a benign fashion. The big trees were left unharmed. My dad says he remembers when it was just open back there, big pines, big cedars, and bunch grass on the ground. But after a few decades of taking fire away from it, it's grown into this explosive mess. A lot of people say logging is the biggest villain of the forest. In a lot of cases, the timber industry has done things that they probably shouldn't have done. But I think Smokey Bear is just as big a villain to the forest as logging ever was. Logging affects the area that's been logged. The Smokey Bear campaign and the mentality of putting out all forest fires starting about 100 years ago has altered more forest than logging ever has. All of the forests in the western United States have been affected by putting fires out. Even the areas we think of as being natural, untouched wilderness. They've all been altered by putting fires out. A lot of people think the solution is to lock up the forests to protect them from human activity. If we lock up a forest like this one, what we're doing is we're taking away our ability to come in here and fix the problems we've created. If we lock up this forest, we are dooming this forest to look like this.
That's what's going to happen if we don't do anything with this forest. In trying to preserve these big beautiful trees, we are dooming these trees to die. A lot of people think since fires are natural, if we just lock up the forest, leave them to nature, fire will take care of the problem. Just let nature take its course. The problem with that is the forests are no longer natural. We've altered them into a very unnatural condition. Now if we just turn these forests back to nature, nature is going to destroy these unnatural forests. By trying to preserve these forests, we're going to make sure these forests become this. Imagine a zoo animal, an animal that's adapted to a certain environment, but that animal was born and raised in a zoo, spent its whole life in a zoo being cared for by humans. That is no longer a natural animal. Say one day you decided to set that animal free in its natural environment. That environment is going to eat that animal alive. It will destroy that animal. It's the same with the forests. These forests have grown up for the last 80, 90 years without fire, without the natural force that kept them in balance. Now if we just lock up these forests, let nature take its course, nature is going to destroy these unnatural forests. By trying to preserve these forests, we're going to make sure these forests become this. If you want to set an animal free that's grown up in captivity, you have to train it, train it to live in the wild. It's similar with these forests. If we want to turn it back to nature, we need to restore them first. We need to restore them back to a natural condition. If we don't set them back to a natural balance before setting them free, nature is going to destroy these unnatural forests. So what's the solution to all this? I don't know. This is on such a massive scale of the entire western United States forests, I don't know what the practical solution is. If this was my land, I would be taking out these firs. I'd be selling them to the mill, cutting them away from the pines. In some cases, that could be profitable. In a lot of places, it wouldn't be. But it could be used to help subsidize mechanically thinning out these forests, then returning prescribed fire. But that is not likely to happen here on Forest Service land because it's Forest Service land. This land is likely going to be locked up to preserve it. And it's going to end up like this. I don't think a lot of people understand just how big of a scale this problem is. Even if the Forest Service was allowed to have people come in here and mechanically try to restore this forest, where are they going to get the funding to do that on millions of acres of land across the western United States? Where are they going to get the workforce? Who's going to do the work? It's hard enough to get people to do any work as it is. There may be some good answers to those questions, but it's not going to happen here. I'm sure a lot of us can come up with all kinds of idealistic ideas of what they ought to do is blah, blah, blah. But the reality is in a place like this on Forest Service land, especially where old growth is involved, not going to happen. This area is likely going to be locked up, which will ultimately destroy this old growth forest. Our society uses a lot of wood products. They are considered to be a renewable resource. Most of those wood products come from clear-cut logging. Would it make more sense to start getting more of our wood products from places like these where we could restore forests by removing excess trees that just shouldn't be here? Seems like a good idea to me, although here on Forest Service land, likely not going to happen because it's Forest Service land. What do you think? What is the solution to all of this?